My definition of a hero is someone who takes the time to see and the effort to act on behalf of someone else. It doesn't require a title, no equipment, no superpowers, just attentive to someone beside yourself and willingness to act. We all have those moments where we need a little encouragement to get through our day. Someone to remind us that we are not alone. Find peace. Embrace joy. Seek God daily. Welcome to Jesus Calling Stories of Faith. Today, we talk with pilot Captain Tammy Jo Schultz. In April 2018, Captain Schultz was flying Southwest Flight 1380 when the left engine of the plane suddenly exploded. Tammy Jo was faced with a scenario she had practiced for but had never encountered in her days of piloting, navigating a severely damaged plane to a safe landing. Before this day, Tammy Jo recalls the tough road she traveled to achieve her dream of becoming a pilot, and how some of those difficult moments from her Navy years gave her the strength and skill to handle the plane on that fateful day, and her faith in God gave her the peace and calm she needed to guide 148 passengers to safety. Well, I'm Tammy Jo Schultz. I live here in Bernie, Texas, and if I were to describe myself, I would say I'm a wife and a mother, um, certainly a daughter, and am blessed to be in this time in history and in this country. Also have had such an advantage in growing up in a wonderful home in New Mexico, cherished by my family and raised in a faith that there were no second-class citizens. So whenever I dreamed about what I wanted to do in life, I dreamed without fences. We did a lot of outdoor playing, I think, at the urging of my mom, even if we hadn't wanted to, but, but we did. It was just a lot of mud pies and pretending like we were pirates or we were getting away from pirates. And it was pretty simple, and yet it was wonderfully full childhood. My dad's past, but I was so blessed to have a dad that uh, I look around now and realize how singular he was. I mean, he was a humble farmer, uh, mechanic turned farmer, back to mechanic. And, um, but he, I would give him a healthy dose of, of uh, credit for my self-esteem. I think fathers play a huge role and girls' self-esteem. And so I grew up with a father that, I mean, I got in trouble just like everybody else, but he was never disappointed in me. And he was never, he never had a lower es estimation of me or my abilities uh, or my capabilities. And so um, I think part of it is the joy of realizing not only did I have an incredible father, but I have an incredible heavenly father. Journaling started, my dad asked me if I'd like to help him with the ranch journal, keeping track of who had babies when and when they were weaned and how much they were eating and things like that. And so I did that and felt quite important about it. And then whenever I got my first 4-H calf, George, a Brangus calf, um, I journaled to keep track of his um, what I was feeding him, how much, how much he was weighing and gaining and how, you know, walking him and uh, all the things that go along with keeping a, you know, raising a show steer. And and it wasn't long be before my journal entries about George kind of got stretched to journal entries about this and that's at school. And 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 I, I found it and I, I still, it's a lifelong thing that I, I enjoy, not for anyone else's reading, they would think it gibberish probably, but it it really helped me to get it out of my mind on paper so I don't have to hold on to it anymore. And especially if, if I'm frustrated about a situation or someone in my path that I just can't figure out or has 
terribly offended me. You know, I can write it down and leave it there. And and about half of my journal entries are, are addressed to my Heavenly Father, just saying, how can this be and why is this? And and but it it does help me just to leave it. And and also in the praises. I mean, there are so many times that I've had incredible either answers to prayer, um, and just witness some really cool things. Our place was um, probably about 30 miles from Holloman Air Force Base as the crow flies, and they would practice practice air combat maneuvering. And they needed a ground reference point, so they used our big hay barn. And that would be our daily air show while while we were you know, mucking out stalls or stock trailers of organic fertilizer, uh, I would see that and just think, that looks fantastic. I mean, not only cleaner than what I'm doing, but it just looks really exciting. And But thinking about something and seeing it from a distance, never having met anyone who did that, it still seemed pretty out of reach. And then I read a book called Jungle Pilot, which was about a Mission Aviation Fellowship pilot named Nate Saint. And that was my eighth grade summer before I went into high school. And it just made me feel like I could see aviation from behind a pilot's eyes. And so I felt like I kind of got to wrap my mind around it. And that was definitely what I wanted to do. When I, I wrapped my mind around trying to get into flying, and realized that I'd like to do military flying. I'd like to serve my country. And it was also a great way to learn to fly. And I went to career day and the colonel at career day said, well, this is career day, not hobby day. You need to go find something girls can do. And I was shocked because I I had grown up in a family that there was no lines drawn between what I did and my brother did. And and so I I was shocked that there were those lines in the the real world, so to speak. And I told my folks and they they were ranchers, they didn't know. So they said, um, well, go to plan B. And after a few years at college on plan B, I saw a lady getting her Air Force wings at a winging and so I went up and talked to her and she, she told me how she'd gotten in through ROTC. I was a junior or senior in college, so it was too late for me to redo college in ROTC. I went to the Air Force, which said, no, you can't take the test. We're not giving you an application. We don't need girls. And so I waited for a different recruiter to be behind the desk a few days later. And I went in and he said, no, we don't need girls. So I went and cut out the the advertisement in the, in the newspaper because they were advertising, if you have your four-year degree and you want to fly, the Air Force wants you. So I cut it out and I went and the um, Air Force recruiter said, no, don't come back. If you have a brother, we're interested, but we don't need girls. And the Army just said, you are not a fit for us. And then the Navy said, sure, you can take a test. It took them a couple of years before I I could find a recruiter. It was about three recruiters later that I found one that would actually take my application. <laughs> so yes, it took a while to get through that, that fortified line. After getting my wings, and going back to instruct for a couple of years for a great a great skipper. He had a change of command and I had a new skipper come on board. And at that point I was um, I was getting ready to teach the advanced stages in T2, like gunnery pattern and things like that. And he pulled my gunnery pattern qual. Uh, I had done my test and everything to get ready to get my qual and he said no. No girls are going to fly guns in my squadron. And there, was not, there wasn't girls, it was just me. Uh, but I, it was a very public shaming. And I was sent to teach out of control flight instead. And it was one of those things where it wasn't fair. But there are some times when we just have to take what's not fair and, and work around it. I realized, you know, I'm, 
I'm assigned to fly out of control flights, so I will just do, do it the best I can. And that actually was one of probably some of the best training I had in all my Navy experience was my year of teaching out of control flight. And uh, T2 instructing was not my final destination in the Navy. It was simply one set of orders before I went into the fleet. So whether I flew gunnery pattern or out of control flight, I was still gonna go somewhere else in the fleet. And it wasn't gonna change the fact that I had Navy wings on my chest. So I just thought it wasn't fair, but life isn't always fair to most of the people I know. And is this something I can put up with? You know, cause I can still keep going. And so I think part of that is learning not to be offended when you're not treated fair, but also just to reanalyze your own motives, your own merit, and, and then quite frankly, being a Christian, I had somebody to go to, to lay it before. I think about how Hezekiah went before the Lord with the, uh, the letter from the, I think it's the Assyrian king saying, I've wiped out everyone else and now you're next. And he's thinking, we can't, we can't do this. We cannot make it. And, and then in the Psalms, how David constantly lays it before the Lord. And, and it's, it's always amusing to me, like in Psalm 35, contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Rise up with sword and buckler. And you get this fight song going, and then by the end of the Psalm, he's praising the Lord. And God does that whenever we go and take those things to him and just say, it's not fair. And my mom encouraged me on this. She said, take it to the Lord. Tell, tell the Lord on them and then pray for them because it's really hard to have the wrong attitude when you've laid it before the Lord and then you pray for them. That's one of the reasons he asks us to pray for people that don't treat us very well because he'll do with them. And, but dealing with us and our own heart in that situation is really the first step to overcoming it. But the leadership always sets the tone. I had my Navy skipper she was instrumental in women in military aviation period. She was in the first class of military women aviators um, in the Navy, which Rosemary Mariner was in, graduated with their wings of gold in 1974. She was also the first woman to fly jets in the United States. And then she was the first woman to be an aviation skipper or commanding officer of an aviation squadron. And that happened to be the squadron I went to as my fleet squadron. So I got to know her just because I was one of her junior officers. And she was, um, she was singular in many ways. She was, first of all, brilliant. I think she graduated from Purdue at 19 with an aeronautical degree and her commercial license. You know, so she was no slacker. But she was also a good person and, um, a, a very people-oriented person. She, she was a champion of people, not just a champion of women. And she really followed through on helping, whether it was enlisted or officers, getting into their next, their next step in the military or if it was out of the military. And her wisdom was something that, that guided us in many, many times as a squadron. And then also as women, getting into new areas like uh, Pam Carroll, who I mentioned a couple of times in the book, she and I both went to the A7 weapons detachment before women were going into combat. But she saw it, she saved up and sent us to do that because we'd had an abbreviated syllabus and didn't get to do that when we went through A7s uh, originally. And she saw that the laws of the land were changing. So uh, Pam and I still both don't know whether it was to prepare us or to prove to them that women could fly weapons. And so we went and did that. And that was when there were congressional committees looking at lifting the combat exclusion policy. And then whenever Pam and I went to fly F-18s, there hadn't been women go through the F-18 rag in Lemoore before. And she blocked all media, all interviews, all anything, and just said, nope, nothing. Because 
you're going to be fading, facing enough backlash for being the first women going through there. You don't need the jealousy of your peers because you're getting singled out when they're doing the same thing you're doing. And, and just her, her wonderful brand of common sense, which is if you're just as good at flying as the men, then it shouldn't be a big deal that you're flying these. So she was singular. I had been asked to mentor some young ladies in the, what they call the Greystone Prep Academy, which is a military prep school in the university in Kerrville. And uh, through the years, they, they wound up coming over for weekends. And um, just because devotions and things like that are a part of my life, uh, they would ask, you know, how did you get through this or that in the military? And, and really one of their biggest questions was, how did you manage a marriage and a family? And I was always, it was curious to me that they were, all of them didn't have any desire to check in their, their girl card to become a military member. You know, that we still like to be women. Uh, but, but a gentleman at my church offered me a box of these lovely Jesus Calling leather bound that he had a re the responsibility of making sure they got into hands, I believe of military personnel. And these ladies were all headed that way. And I started reading through Jesus Calling with my family first. And then whenever I'd read enough of it to feel like, okay, this is, this is great. I started passing it out to the girls because every year there'd be a different group of girls. And they would start uh, taking a snapshot and, and sharing it just in case somebody was behind a day or something and saying, oh, I loved it this morning. And especially, I would say, for busy lives where you're, you're not wanting to spend a lot of time, you know, Bible study time sometimes is separate from just morning devotions, morning quiet time. For me it is, because I don't always have the time in the morning to have a full blown Bible study. But I need that one-on-one -on -one with the Lord before I face the day, before I face other people. We'll be right back to hear about the fateful day where Tammy Jo called on the training she received and on God for strength and wisdom as she faced the life-threatening situation aboard Southwest Flight 1380 right after this brief message about a way you can connect with other Jesus Calling readers through a weekly prayer call. Did you know that Sarah Young, the author of Jesus Calling, prays for her readers each day? In that spirit, we want to extend the Jesus Calling prayer community out to you in a more personal way. Each Tuesday morning, you can dial into the Jesus Calling Weekly Prayer Call, where the team from Jesus Calling and special guests will minister to us during a 10-minute call to reflect on that day's passage from Jesus Calling, read scripture references, and pray together for each other and our world. Prayer call times are 8 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Central, 6 a.m. Mountain, and 5 a.m. Pacific, and are for U.S. only. For more information on the Jesus Calling Weekly Prayer Call or to submit prayer requests, please visit jesuscalling.com slash prayer dash call. Tammy Jo's uphill climb to become a pilot may have seemed frustrating and unfair, but the training she got and the mentorship she received from great women in her field propelled her to become one of a select number of female commercial airline pilots and also prepared her for perhaps the greatest challenge of her life. When I first got to Southwest, I, I realized that I have, I have more of a responsibility as an airline pilot than I did as an F-18 pilot. I mean, and there was a lot of responsibility in that, but I just, I, I have responsibilities for other people's lives, not just flying the best aircraft I can, but, but also, I mean, how they're treated on board too. And, and that's not just the flight attendant's job. That's, that's the whole crew's responsibility. 
April 17th last year. Darren Elliser was my first officer. And we started in Nashville. We met the flight attendants, Rachel Fernheimer, Shanique Mallory, and Catherine Sandoval at the airplane. And for the first time, uh, I try to make a habit of bringing coffee with me to the aircraft. It seems to bring everybody together faster than if I say, you want to get together for the captain briefing? <laughs> so we all met around some coffee and chatted about the, the day ahead, how far we were all going and, and what the weather was like, different things like that. And, and then we had a little time to chat about just where everybody was from or things like that. Catherine, it was, she'd been at Southwest for six weeks on that day, so she was very new. And Shanique had come from uh, being, a cus being a customer service representative, I believe. And then Rachel had been flying for a, a, about four years, I think, for Southwest at the time. So then when we landed in LaGuardia, we had a little extra time in between flights and we we got to chatting a little bit more and and realize a little bit more about each other before we took off and it was planned for a four-hour flight so darren's turn to fly we took off and 20 minutes into the flight passing through 32,500 feet we thought darren and i comparing notes uh, months after it happened we both thought we'd been hit by another aircraft the jolt was so hard Southwest 1380 has an engine fire descending. Yeah, we have a part of the aircraft. And we were just uh, pushed sideways, and the aircraft went into a snap roll to the left. We both lunged for the controls and caught it going past 40 degrees angle of bank and righted it. And by that time, initially we had seen the engines, the number one engine rolling back, the instruments blinking and showing that that engine wasn't any good anymore. And then we couldn't see anything and we couldn't hear anything because after, after the initial shock of it all happening and we're descending just because we're heavy and we, own, we have this immense amount of drag now where the engine had peeled back something like a banana peeling and remained attached, but now those big pieces were flailing in 500 mile an hour wind. And there was also such a shudder involved with that we couldn't focus on the engine instrumentation. A cloud of smoke came in, probably from the exploded engine through the air conditioning system. And, and with the window also being busted out, why there was that roar going by the window of 500 mile an hour wind. Darren and I, I had give, looked at him and given him a nod as I took my hands off the controls to let him know you're still flying, even though we couldn't verbally communicate. And we used hand signals for the first few moments. And that is when I, you know, there's nothing to look at in the cockpit. I can't focus on anything. I can't communicate to anyone. And there's a stabbing pain in, in my ears and I can't breathe. So it was a kind of a, a forced moment of silence in that there was nothing I could really do. And I remember looking out the, just the window straight ahead thinking, I'm not sure everything we need to fly is gonna stay on. Um, I've never experienced anything quite like this. And if that's the case, then this could be the day I meet my maker. And you kind of have a mental rush doing this. Adrenaline kicks in and you can think so leisurely, but in such a tiny slice of time. And I remember kind of getting to that mental cliff of what if and thinking, if that's the case, and that's when I stopped and just stepped back and thought, I wouldn't be meeting a stranger. And I had that calm that just met, let me know that's not really something I'm dreading. But on the good side, on the good news also is that we're still flying. And I'm not sure everyone feels the same way about it <laughs> that I do. So the good news is we're flying, we'll just get back to work. And by that time the smoke had cleared out, we had slowed down enough that we could see our engine instruments, read checklists, get our oxygen masks on, communicate a little bit. We told Philadelphia that we wanted to go to Philly. And then I communicated to the back because 
because I thought as much as it's startling for us up here with control of things and seeing what's going on, it's got to be mind numbing fright going on in the back where all you have is what's happened. You have no knowledge of what's going on. So pushed my PA button and made a PA that said, it wasn't my most elegant PA, but it was that we're not going down. We're going into Philly because I wanted to, to know that the cockpit was still in control of the airplane. We had a plan and we had a destination. And at that point, that's when the flight attendants unbuckled and headed through an aisle that was so rough, they had sprained back, uh, bruised ribs, lacerations just from going down the aisle to, to help people get their oxygen masks on and to tell them we're, we're going into Philly. And it was a takeaway for me that that element of hope had such a change on people and their actions and their reactions. It didn't change our circumstances. Hope doesn't have to change our circumstances to change us. And so the flight attendants unbuckled, started telling people what our destination was. And it wasn't until they got even with row 14 that they saw where the breach in the cabin was and what had happened there. And there were three passengers that unbuckled, left their oxygen masks, their families to go towards an open, very dangerous window, not knowing if more would tear out. Tim McGinty, Andrew Needham, and then later Peggy Phillips, a retired nurse, uh, unbuckled and came to do CPR on the passenger. And whenever we got closer to the ground, um, we had some issues to deal with that were new to us. The um, airplane, whenever I tried to add power and turn right, I wasn't able to. I had so much drag pulling to the left. And when I add power, then that pushed us to the left so there wasn't any turning right until I did something different. And there was just this pause in the cockpit voice recorder whenever we listened to it. And then you hear my voice just asking, just in a question, two words, and it's Heavenly Father. And I didn't realize till then that it was out loud. I thought it was a private conversation. But Darren kind of teased me, he goes, I knew you were praying. <laughs> I said, yes, all the way down. But um, I was thinking, Heavenly Father, what am I missing? I know we didn't wrestle with this for 30,000 feet, not to be able to turn in the last 2,000 and make it to the runway. And um, just kind of having that mental breathing room in prayer, I realized, okay, uh, asymmetrical thrust is pushing me away. So I took off the thrust, turned around, and then added a little bit back in. We just weren't able to add much thrust because as we slowed down to land, that gives us less airflow over the rudder, which keeps our nose straight. So um, as, as I slowed down, I was only able to have less and less power available. Got our gear down at the right amount of time so that we made the runway a little slower and a little below glide slope, but. Southwest 1380, right turn when you're able. You wanna stop wherever you need to is fine. Thank you. We're going to stop right here by the uh, fire truck. Thanks, guys, for the help. Made the runway, and I was so impressed with the people on board, not just the heroes that I mentioned, but and my crew, which were all amazing heroes in this situation, but the, the entire group of passengers. When we landed, there wasn't this angry frustration and surge for the doors. I walked back to, to reassure people, help the flight attendants, and everyone was calmly seated, attentive to what we had to say. And um, when we told them, we'd like for you to remain seated, there's air stairs on the way, but we do have a medical emergency. We'd like to take care of her first, if you'll remain seated. Everyone was so attentive and quiet, and it just made me feel like everyone felt the value of human life that day and no one knew Jennifer and Jennifer knew no one on that plane. But you don't have to know someone for them to have value. And I think it goes directly to our human, the, the American culture being 
and our human value, our value on human life being rooted in the Judeo-Christian value that you don't have to be of royalty or of nobility or of worth in the world's eyes to, to have worth. And of course, we were all glad that we had made the runway. Uh, but the survival of 148 will never eclipse the loss of one. And we were thrilled to return 148 people to their lives and loved ones. And it will always weigh heavy on our heart that we weren't able to do that for Jennifer. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And that day really, I feel like was the first day I understood those words. To read more about Tammy Jo's life and about the heroic flight she piloted to safety, check out her book, Nerves of Steel, available wherever books are sold. Next time on Jesus Calling Stories of Faith, we talk with NFL Hall of Fame quarterback, Kurt Warner. Kurt's dream of playing in the NFL didn't come as soon as he expected, and a series of twists and turns left him wondering if he would ever achieve his goals. When he finally did see his dream come to light, he was able to look back and see how God was preparing him, not only athletically, but spiritually as well. I was fortunate to have a lot of success in the game, uh, but the biggest part of things is how many people can associate with my story and the fact that life doesn't always play out as you want it to, and sometimes there's struggles and perseverance that you have to have along the way to ultimately accomplish your goal. So um, through all those ups and downs, uh, finally got uh, that second chance in the league and, and was fortunate to, uh, to turn it into a pretty good career and uh, finishing up just a couple years ago by uh, being selected into the Hall of Fame. Thank you for watching Jesus Calling Stories of Faith. To learn more about how to keep up with our shows bi-monthly and to listen to our weekly podcast, please visit youtube.com slash Jesus Calling Book to view and hear previous episodes and to watch a short informational video about how to access all things Jesus Calling on audio and video formats. Plus, learn how to subscribe to our podcast and video channels. Your subscription helps get the word out to more people who will benefit from these inspirational stories of faith.